looking at the urban landscape, she really started to become an activist because she lived in the, in the village of Greenwich, or the Greenwich Village. In, if you've been to New York, you've probably all been to Greenwich Village. And at that time, the um, planning folks were going to put a highway right through and do this sort of urban renewal thing. And they took down the this, this small buildings that there were four stories uh, and they had people living in it. And we're going to put up these huge towers instead, which uh, not unlike what we've got here, but for residential. And then she started to realize the impact that that would have on the street life and the way people connected and the health of the community. So she became an activist and actually got it stopped. So we still have Greenwich Village today because of the work of, of Jane. And she was kind of labeled as a nutcase, you know, and people said that that odd dame they used to call her in, this, in the 50s. And then she was hauled out. Just eccentric, Paul. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then at one time uh, when she was protesting, she caused such a stir that they hauled her away. They took her off to jail. That was in 1968. And so she moved, she moved from Tor um, New York to Toronto and became a Canadian citizen and spent the rest of her life in Toronto. So we like to think of her as a famous Canadian. And for all the work, traffic engineers have won and they've taken out all the cars. All it does is have the effect of speeding the traffic up and it makes the street it's actually feel feel less safe. So having the barricade of the angled parking and then the cars is actually better. Markers that talk about the identity of the place. So who we are as a people, where we've come from, what does this mean? What is this building all about? And we'll see several of those on this walk. And it's really important for us to know and feel connected to a space. Um, there's some recent research done by the Knight the Knight Institute, and they talk about what attaches people to a community. And the things are the social offerings, the aesthetics of a place, and the openness of how connected we are. This is a really interesting spot because for 10 years after this building burnt down here, this was a hole, and there was a fence around this hole. And what happened was people would go down uh, less desirables would go down in that hole. There was sleeping and camping happening down there. There was drug abuse happening. And then the kids from that school would, I mean, they love holes in the industry. So they would go down in the hole. So it was a dangerous, it was a very dangerous place. So there was a number of people that really wanted to see this hole filled and something to happen. And so here's the first example of a citizen that's just taken pride and done their thing. And this is not designed by anybody, it's designed by them. So it's got a very personal touch and it's a, it's a great space in our community. Look at the way they've done this street. Yeah. This is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. There's benches along and there's flowers. There's some historical signage along here, lighting. This is a good example of what you can do to a pretty boring wall. What people don't necessarily understand is that building on properties and doing the kind of walkability things that we're doing in the downtown is also good financially for the community. Because if you imagine that these, these parking lots are sitting here with, and they're collecting say $2,000 a year in tax revenue, which we use to support roads and maintenance and pools and all of that stuff, what is the difference between the tax revenue that would be collected from an apartment building like that one, maybe that's an old one, and one of the parking lot right beside it? It's huge. And so every time we actually limit the amount of park, or we, or we uh, allow for more parking in the downtown, we actually, not only does it cost us to build it, not only does it cost us in our health and our connections to our community, but financially it costs us a fortune. And so we sprawl more and we build more parking lots and that is a downward spiral we just can't keep doing. We've got to figure out how to make communities walkable and more interesting. Boxes are all over the city and they're, what's interesting is we put them out because we didn't want to see drug addicts particularly dropping their needles in the park. But what's been most interesting is most of these needle drop boxes are used for people that have diabetes and so they they use them and put their needles in there so it does it serves two purposes actually so I, they're not scary things they're actually they're good to have around this this is one of from my perspective one of the most exciting things that we have happening in the downtown this year um, in 2010 when I was running for election the first time I had hundreds of children tell me there's no spray park in our city. They have to drive to Lacombe or they've got to go to Stetler. 
This is going to be a spray park for kids. Oh, wow. And this park will hold 360 people. Nice. Yeah. Is it going to be as big as the fence? Yes. Yeah, this whole park. This whole space in here with the changing rooms. Got the seniors, and it's lovely to look out your window, I'm sure, and see a park. But if the park is empty, that can be pretty boring after a while. But if the park is full, two things will happen. The ones that are positive will have something to talk about and look at and, and enjoy, and the ones that are negative will have something to complain about. Parkades in the downtown are needed because they get people, they get cars off the streets and into cheaper parking where you can free up street parking in the middle of um, the downtown. This is, I think, our first attempt at a green roof in Red Deer, and it's covered with sedum, which is slowly starting to root, and it's it's it, yeah people people don't think it's healthy but it, in the at this time of year it's not alive quite yet but it will it will pick up so it's slowly getting its roots what's growing up there sedum sedum, sedum. 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 No, it's, a, it's a perennial perennial it does good in rock gardens hot sunny areas yeah right up in the tops of mountains you'll see sedum a lot so this is this actually keeps the idea is that a green roof will keep the space from being a heat sink so that it doesn't create a hot, really hot climate. Like you've got all of this black pavement everywhere in the downtown, which creates extra heat. So anytime we put green roofs on the rest of our buildings, um, it absorbs some of that heat, releases the right kind of um, uh, oxygen into the air, which is helpful, and also cools that building a little bit. five years ago this was installed and it was part of the first renovations remember I said that this street didn't used to have these trees didn't used to have this pavement 2005, 2005. see how fast time goes and this uh, this piece I wanted to show you because it's a good example of a piece of art that people interact with the first year this was in, was installed people came along at Easter and put uh, Easter bonnets on it and did they do they do things to this just like Reverend Gates, they put scarves on him and they do things to him as well, and they sit and interact with him. This artist, uh, Brian and Don Dedorando, are local artists, and, and their art is right across Canada. It's a fabulous example of um, one of our local artists doing some great things. The one-way streets are, um, a good, are, are known now to be the thing that kills downtowns. And if we stand on this corner of two one-way streets, we can see how fast the traffic moves and how difficult it is to talk and how uncomfortable it feels. One of the things that we talked about on Ross Street was that you need, to, you need that parking to protect the pedestrian from the traffic. And they've noticed that in environments where they've tried to set up street cafes, but they don't have that parking, and here's an example of a street cafe right behind us, they never work because nobody feels comfortable enough and there's not that barrier between the traffic that's moving too fast and the people that are trying to enjoy a coffee. Also a piece of art done by Brian and Don. This is the same people that did the bunny. And it's one, it's the latest ghost statue and it's called Waiting for Gordon. And this is Mrs. Sorensen of the Sorensen Station. And um, she ran the Blue Derby Cafe. And it was a, it was a coffee shop and then he, Gordon, ran the bus lines. And so she would she would come out when she knew the bus was coming by or coming by she would bring out his coffee and wait for Gordon so he could continue on his his travels. So this used to be the station where people went all over um, Central Alberta. <laughs> so most successful little experiments that we did in the city about ten years ago, would you say? This little pond went in, and I wish it were running. It's an example of. Our city actually I don't think starts early enough in the spring. We sometimes hear complaints about the bathrooms not being opened on the trails at this time of year and closing a little bit too early. And this is a good example to me. It's warm out. Yeah. If this were running, there would be people everywhere. So this is um, a much quieter street as you can tell. So this is Little Gates Avenue and it was designed and imagined about five years ago and then it worked its way through city council and through planning and through engineering and all of the things that had to go through in order to have it happen. 
that a part of this street it had to have all of the servicing underground replaced as well so this what this street wasn't just putting in planters and benches it was much more intense it was a two-year project where they had all the streets ripped up and they replaced everything underneath and then widened the sidewalks put in angled parking added trees added interesting sculptures along the way in the culture vision of 2008 this street is imagined to be the international district for our community and if you look around the street you start to start part of that is because people started noticing that there needed to be more diversity in our community there was a value of diversity but also start things were starting to pop up that were expressing its diversity so we had um, you can imagine remember some of the restaurants along here the Vietnamese place and then the Indian place and the Thai place and etc etc so lots of different things and so the thought was how do you how do you enhance that and make it even more culturally diverse one now you now you'll see that the the businesses on either side will start to create the street environment that you want in good design you've got to always remember that it's the design you see is about 70 percent your eyesight is not 90 percent up it's about here so what you're seeing from here up and down that's the that's the piece that we've got to pay attention to when we good, do good design yeah. here's an example of good traffic and I don't, you know, I'm not going to say traffic calming, and I think it's a mistake that actually the city makes. We talk about traffic calming instead of street enhancement. And so when you talk about traffic calming, the motorists get all upset that somehow they're going to lose something. But if you talk about street enhancement, most people want street enhancement, even the motorists. So what happened uh, last year was the first year that the Ross Street patio went in. Do you all remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's a really interesting design because if you look at the Cenotaph, there's two lanes that come around the Cenotaph and then it turns into three. So from a safety perspective, what happens right at that point is that everybody starts switching lanes so they can get in front of the other person to get to the light before the next guy, right? So the, our, the um, uh, people that came to do some walking studies with us said, why don't you just take that lane away, that one lane, because you don't need it anyway. People are going through usually and uh, turn it into a pedestrian space and so that's what happened in uh, November of 2011. Uh, they did a one weekend trial and there were 200 people down there to listen to listen to he and hear about walkability and then last spring they introduced the Ross Street patio and it became one of Red Deer's identi identifying features. We loved that patio. Is that If you put people first then the cars are not first. So you don't push a button and you wait for the light to turn. Walkability, like we, what we've crossed here and all the way down Little Gates, allows us to stop there and the car stop for us and we cross. Or where you push a button, the light changes yellow right away and you can cross. Those are good examples of walkability. Where you push the button and then you wait for four or five cycles to happen. That's not putting a pedestrian first, that's putting a car first. So anytime we can do this, we act, it actually improves the traffic as well because it only changes or they only have to stop when we're going to cross. Our tour uh, and our talking about walking and uh, so are there any questions or thoughts as we wrap up? Something that you learned that you thought hey I didn't know that that's helpful or some reflection you have about um, the experience. Well, definitely Red Deer is a work in progress. There's a lot of things that have been done and we can see that there's a lot of things that can be done too. Yes. True. I like the idea of trying things. I like the idea of try the city trying things. Yep, yeah, the city tries out things and that's I think that's one of our strengths. About, uh, how when you're driving you're looking for things that are familiar and franchises work really well. And uh, and but what you end up is you get a whole bunch of the same thing. Every every city looks exactly the same. They all got the same stores, and people who drive are less likely to stop at places that aren't part of a big franchise. They don't have a big logo that they recognize. And when you walk, it actually opens up a whole new world and it changes your perspective. And I never really realized that because get our one-way roads into two-way roads and calm things down so so vulnerable people, our seniors, our our disabled citizens can can enjoy enjoy our downtown. The things I learned today is um, how uh, the city of Red Deer is evolving quite uh, rapidly. 
we see that there's very nice path, very um, well designed place to be and to walk and other places uh, need serious improvement. Uh, it's interesting to know that uh, uh, people in Red Deer um, now will bring some conditions to the new owners, new builders as to how they need to build thinking about the pedestrian. So yeah, and it, it was a very interesting walk.